I'm here with number one New York Times bestselling author and TV writer for shows like Diagnosis, Murder, and Monk, the terrific, prolific Lee Goldberg. Uh, I hardly know where to begin with Lee. Uh, on the novel writing side, he's written on eight book series, including 22 books in the Dead Man series, 15 books in the Monk series, eight books in the Diagnosis, Murder series, eight books with Janet Ivanovich on the Fox and O'Hare series, and a lot more and not to mention being twice nominated for an Edgar Award, I think throw in a Seamus Award nomination in there. Uh, and then on the TV writing side, I already mentioned Monk and Diagnosis Murder, but Lee's got significant writing credits on uh, the detective comedy Psych, uh, a television series adapted from Rex Stout's Detective Stories, a Nero Wolf mystery, a crime drama television series, The Glades, and Mystery 101 on the Hallmark Movies and Mystery Channel. And that's just mystery and crime writing and doesn't cover his work on productions like Baywatch or Sequest. I think of Flip course maybe. you had to mention Baywatch. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to. You want, uh, and, uh, and many other shows uh, Lee has had a hand in. Oh, you should be proud of that. I think a lot of people uh, are, are pretty excited about oh, that. Oh, the credit I'm most proud of, though, you glossed right over. Oh, yeah? Which is The New Adventures of Flipper. I Flipper. mean, that's one that I still dine out on. It, well, people are so impressed that I wrote for a dolphin. I guess uh, easy softball to throw out. Do you consider yourself more of a uh, novel writer who writes screenplays or a screenplay writer who writes novels? I'm a writer, pure and simple. That's what I do. Whether it's books or television or nonfiction or articles, I write. <laughs> and um, there was a, a big lesson I was taught by my mentor, a, a writer producer named Michael Gleason who created Remington Steel. And he said, in this business, you become a supervising producer, an executive producer, and it's very easy to get married to your title and kind of box yourself in, but you should always remember you're a writer first and foremost. I, I go where the story takes me or where the, the jobs take me. I don't define myself as a TV writer or a novelist or a journalist or a nonfiction writer. Well, that's, yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so you've also written nonfiction, right? Yeah, I've, I've written quite a bit of nonfiction. Probably my most successful nonfiction books are unsold television pilots. Every idea considered by the networks for a TV show since 1955. And a book uh, William Rabkin and I wrote, God, 20 years ago called Successful Television Writing that's still being used as a textbook in schools all around the country to this day, um, which is great. That's great. Um... You know, I, I mentioned uh, Janet Ivanovich earlier, and uh, I was actually in a 2019 Thriller Fest um, panel while I was, I was an attendee, that one where you were on. I think uh, Boyd Morrison was there, mm -hmm. maybe John Land, I can't remember. And you said that um, uh, Janet Ivanovich, you've learned a lot from her, even though you already had uh, multiple books out at that time, of course. Um, uh, you had, had kind of taken your, your writing to the next level. Um, what did she, she teach you? Or what did writing with her she mean for you? Even though I've been writing books for so long and have had some success at it, I really found my voice thanks to Janet. She, she gave me so much great advice. I could probably spend two hours going through it all. But some of the, the key ones were don't draw attention to your writing because it reminds the reader they're reading a book and pulls them out of the fantasy, pulls them out of the adventure they're in. If you have something to, clever to say, put it in the mouth of one of the characters and not in the, in the, the, the prose. And don't over-describe things. Just find the one salient point and, and use that. And, and everything else will fall into place. And just along the way, working with her, I, I just learned so much about myself and how to tell a story in the novel form in my own voice that I'm a far better writer for having worked with her than I was before I started working with her. That's great. Um, and, and, you know, speaking of writing, uh, of course, which is all we're doing, uh, um, you founded Brash Books, is that right? Yeah, I founded Brash Books with my old friend, Joel Goldman. Yeah, and, um, and from what I understand, you published New Crime and also um, some great critically acclaimed books that uh, are no longer in publication. Well, Brash arose out of the success that Joel and I were having publishing our out-of-print backlists. Lots of writers, friends of ours, were coming up to us at conferences and saying, God, I wish I could have the success doing it that you guys have had. Could you help me out? And we realized, you know, there might actually be a business in this, you know, that maybe we could help them out. We could all share in the spoils. But the, the company really arose out of this desire I had to republish the works of a dead author named Ralph Dennis. 
I figured if I was able to successfully republish my out of print backlist, maybe I could do it for Ralph because I loved his books. They'd fallen into obscurity and I really wanted to get them out there to the, to the wider world. And Joel is a lawyer by trade and I, I sought his advice on how to do that, on how to negotiate with Ralph's estate. And I told him my idea and, Ralph, and Joel got this funny look on his face and he said, we could have a lot of success doing this. I said, we? He said, yeah, we could start a publishing company. We could <laughs> republish the books of our friends, but also guys like Ralph. I said, that's a pretty brash idea. There's the name of our company. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we've been in business now or six or seven years and we've broadened beyond our initial goal of, of republishing great crime fiction that had shaped our writing and our careers and other writers and their careers and have started publishing original crime novels that have done really well and gotten lots of acclaim. So we've taken great pride in, in the original novels that we've published on top of the out of print uh, classics as well. And then we have an offshoot imprint that we just launched called Cutting Edge Books. And that's for books from the 40s and 50s and early 60s that have fallen out of print. Most of the books that we published through Brash are relatively recent. By that, I mean nothing older than the mid-70s. I want to switch gears a little bit and, uh, and talk about uh, some of your, your newest stuff. So I have behind me of a, a couple of books here. Uh, let's see if we can get those in there. Um, Bone Canyon and before that, Lost Hills. Mm -hmm. um, these are coming from Thomas and Mercer. And, uh, and you've had a lot of success uh, with the first, with uh, Lost Hills. Um, so, uh, you know, tell me about, about how that's going with Bone Canyon and, uh, and maybe talk a little bit about uh, Eve Ronan and uh, what kind of character she is. Lost Hills came out of my desire to write a police procedural but also out of my boredom with so many of the police procedurals. They kept having the same character, you know, the, the downtrodden but brilliant cop who's not respected by his peers, who's carrying a deep, dark secret. His family was slaughtered by serial killers and he's an alcoholic and he's impotent. And I, I was just <laughs> tired of all the, all the tropes. And, and even though that he, he solved all these great crimes. Everyone still tells him, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. And, but he's so supremely confident and so brilliant that he still manages to succeed against all these obstacles. But I, I like the proce police procedural form. I was a huge fan of Ed McBain, huge fan of Ian Rankin and Michael Connolly. But I was concerned, what could I bring to it? I mean, they really trod that path well. And I'm in Los Angeles and God knows there have been so many great police procedurals in Los Angeles between just Michael Connolly and Joseph Wambaugh alone. I actually had an idea for a police procedural and I went to a homicide investigators training conference just to get some details, you know, to, to ground my story in a kind of reality. And while I was at this, this seminar where homicide detectives go to recertify every year, they have to learn new techniques and new laws and things, and they share cases and, and what have you. A case was presented that just fascinated me. It was a case that was used as an example of why it's important to approach each homicide as if you've never investigated a homicide before, to walk into each case as a virgin. Because some of your common sense, police common sense, could actually send you down a path that's completely wrong. And, and had the detectives in this particular case used police common sense, they never would have solved the crime. And I, I couldn't get this case out of my head. I just thought it was a great idea. And I could see immediately how to adapt it for a novel. And I had a sleepless night. I said, oh God, how do you get a seasoned detective to approach a case as if, as if he's never solved a, a case before? Well, what if my detective hasn't solved a case before? Well, how would he be in homicide if he hadn't solved the case before? Well. Maybe he's a fraud, or maybe he got in through some back door. Well, I'm so sick of guys being homicide detectives. What if it's a woman? And I just, by the time I, uh, the morning came, I had Eve Ronan, a, a, the youngest female homicide detective in Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department history, who gets the promotion by virtue of a, of a YouTube video that goes viral. And she's smart, but she's inexperienced, and her first case is her first case. And I thought it would be so interesting to have a character who doesn't know it all, who, who makes mistakes, who isn't self-assured. That would be a way to avoid so many of the cliches and tropes of the police procedural. But not only that, I decided to follow that old adage, write what you know. I live in Calabasas, California, uh, in the northwestern edge of the 
San Fernando Valley. And it's, a, it's, a, it's almost an island within Los Angeles County. And our law enforcement is the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. And they patrol Calabasas, Agoura Hills, Malibu, the Santa Monica Mountains, all sorts of socioeconomic and geographical areas that are, that are very different and diverse. So I wrote about this area, which has not been covered in any crime novels that I know of before. And, and the story in a way kind of wrote itself because I had a real life story to base it on. I had a compelling character and I was writing a world that I knew very well. And I brought to it all the lessons I had learned from Janet. I decided to take my authorial voice almost completely out of the book. With the exception of the opening paragraph, there's very little personality in the writing. It's a, sort of just the facts, ma'am. If something clever is said or there's an, a, an interesting observation, I have my, my characters make it. And I wanted the, the experience to almost be like reading a screenplay, to have the dialogue and the action carry the story. And I, it, I found it extraordinarily hard. It, it looks easy when you're reading it. It was extremely hard to write it, but it was, it was very, very exciting. And I'm so pleased that readers have embraced it and critics have embraced it uh, to the degree that they have. And I can't tell you um, who, but um, Lost Hills has been optioned for television by a very, very big uh, television uh, producer. And I have high hopes that it'll be going forward. So Eve is the, the youngest homicide detective. Um, uh, how do you keep her being young and kind of looking at a, at a case in a fresh way, even as, you know, the series, so now I know that you're, you've got the third one kind of in the works and probably you're working on a fourth one, I would guess. Um, how do you keep her being kind of fresh uh, and new, even as she gets more and more experience? The great thing about Eve is that she is new and she's finding her way and she's making mistakes and she doesn't have all the answers, which is great for me as a writer because I'm not taking huge leaps in time with each book. Bone Canyon takes place only a few weeks after Lost Hills and the third book takes place only a few weeks after Bone Canyon. So it's not like she's amassing this huge amount of experience. She is learning from her recent cases, but she's still making mistakes and she still has some character flaws she has to overcome. So it's going to be six, seven, eight, nine books before she's really confident in what she's doing and, and approaching Bosch level <laughs> competence. But she also has so many obstacles in her path. She has her fame, she has her family, and she has a sheriff's department, male and female colleagues who actively hate her for a lot of good reasons, because she leaped over the hierarchy or, or jumped the ladder to get where she is without paying her dues. So the women resent her and so do the men. And she's odd man out, she doesn't know who to trust. And after some events in Bone Canyon, which I won't get into, there are a lot of other reasons for her to be watching her back in the sheriff's department. So there's plenty of conflict uh, to keep me going and, and I'm not worried about her losing her, her neophyte status too soon. Because that's what makes it challenging for me as a writer. I, I don't know that I could write a character who's, who's perfect and knows it all and is supremely self-confident. I don't know if I could write Spencer. Though I have actually, what am I yeah. saying? I wrote three episodes <laughs> of Spencer for Hire. But in those three episodes of Spencer for Hire I did, those episodes were successful because I poked fun at his confidence or questioned his confidence. And that, that was how I was able to get into writing uh, Spencer and Hawk. Well, kind of moving uh, away from the novel writing and over into the screenwriting, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Monk where you wrote, I think, three of the Monk TV episodes, and you also wrote 15, I want to say, Monk books, uh, Mr. I Monk did. books. Well, I was very fortunate. The only tie-in novels I've written were for shows I was already writing for. So I wrote those Diagnosis Murder novels, but I was the executive producer and principal writer of Diagnosis Murder, so it was a very easy transition. In the case of Monk, I'd already written episodes of Monk, when the creator of the show, Andy Breckman, was approached about doing books. And he said, I'm not interested in writing books, but if Lee Goldberg wants to do them, I'm all for it. So I was already steeped in Monk before I started writing the books. And then I had the unique experience, and, and maybe the first time ever, we're not sure, we're trying to find out. I wrote a tie-in, an original novel, Monk novel, called Mr. Monk Goes to the Firehouse. And Andy liked it so much, we adapted it into an episode of Monk called Mr. Monk Can't See a Thing. And I believe that may be the first time a tie-in novel became an episode of the show it was based upon. So it was, 
it was a lot of fun. And, and there are other, uh, other books I wrote in my Monk series that became parts of episodes because um, what I was doing was work for hire. Universal Studios owned every book I wrote. So they could use whatever they wanted from my books in the episodes, which caused me some problems because when elements of my book showed up in the episodes, I started getting emails from people saying, that miserable hack, Lee Goldberg, ripped off Monk. <laughs> I mean, it especially happened when Mr. Monk goes to the firehouse. Goldberg you know, ripped off blatantly the episode, Mr. Monk Can't See a Thing. We had to actually pull the books from publication and add a disclaimer to them saying, Mr. Monk Goes to the Firehouse came first and Lee wrote the episode, Mr. <laughs> Monk Can't See a Thing. Uh, so it, have it happened on fans. three books. There was another one, Mr. Monk and the Blue Flu, which um, became Mr. Monk and the Badge, which I didn't write. Another one, um, Monk, Mr. Monk and the Two Assistants, um, elements of that were used for another episode where Sharona comes back. So we had to put these disclaimers in or people thought that, you know, I was, I was just a, a plagiarist. That's great. Um, before, before we, uh, we started recording, you were telling me a little bit about that poster behind you. Uh, yes. It's not a poster. It's a painting. A painting. It's um, the cover from my 357 Vigilante book series. And I say the cover because the top portion of that painting remained the same and they would change the bottom portion to reflect events in each one of the, of the books. And uh, I was lucky enough to track down the artist and buy the, the painting some years ago. And it reminds me of when I started out and what my hopes and dreams were and how lucky I am to be doing what I'm doing today. And the chair underneath it is the uh, chair from when I was executive producer of Diagnosis Murder that they would drag around on location when we um, were shooting. I kind of wish you'd been sitting in that for our interview. <laughs> um, great. Um, well, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, so thanks very much. And it was, uh, it was great having you on. My pleasure. I miss not doing it live with your studio audience and the band. <laughs> Would you have to put in a laugh track or something at the end? Yeah. <laughs>